Okay. Very good. Welcome, everyone. I'm so glad that uh, you were able to escape the snow or wherever you happen to be in the world right now and join us on this uh, on this call regarding or the Zoom regarding um, special opportunity for board ready women members uh, to to explore some other learning avenues for your board certification. And so today we are joined. I'm one of the founders of Board Ready Women, by the way, for those of you who haven't met me. And we are thrilled today to be introducing um, Michelle Ashby uh, to speak to us about some new opportunities for, for attaining your um, board certification. Um, and so, Michelle, uh, we are an affiliated partnership in an affiliation partnership with Michelle uh, because we do believe that there are many options for board training. And we believe that the more tools that we have available, the more opportunity we will have to um, have more, get more women on boards, which is really our ultimate objective. So Michelle um, is a seasoned professional with a diverse background spanning 30 years as a gold specialist analyst, as a financial expert, an independent corporate director and successful entrepreneur. She was recently recognized as one of the top 25 most powerful women in business in Colorado and top 100 women in mining globally for her work in training a thousand women to get on corporate boards. As a subject matter expert on board governance, finance, diversity and inclusion and strategies, she is a sought after speaker on topics ranging from women's leadership to healing our country. Uh, that, that would be a very interesting, I would love to know how to heal our country too. So maybe that's something we can also talk about. Michelle is also the author of three books and a former athlete having rode 211,036 meters in 24 hours. Holy mackerel, that's amazing. Ms. Ashby has extensive board experience as an independent director with collective corporate board experience of 20 years on six corporate boards, as well as 40 years of nonprofit and trade association board experience. I said, you you are not that old, Michelle. How did you manage to fit all that in? But this is the cumulative efforts of many years on boards. Um, she has founded Danny's Foundation, a nonprofit organization in memory of her daughter, Danny Stell, which contributed over $1 million for Ewing sarcoma cancer research for 15 years. So we are super excited um, about having Michelle here today. And what I just want to read is kind of her key focus area as uh, as as the CEO and founder of ACE LLC. Michelle is a, is a pioneering leader on a mission to train 1,000 women to take their place on corporate boards. She is dedicated to educating, supporting, and teaching women how to attain corporate board positions through the ACE board Certific certificate certification programs for women. So that's, um, yeah, there's lots more to say about Michelle, but I'm going to pass it over to Michelle because this is her time to share with you some of the uh, great things that she has to offer and, and some, and, and really kind of point out some of where we are at um, with the, the boards and, and the gender diversity situation at the moment. So Michelle, I'm going to pass it over to you and thank you very, very much for joining us today. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Heather. It's so great to be here. And thanks to Katerina as well as helping set everything up with your organization. So welcome, ladies. Um, I'm going to start out to just give you an idea of how I got into doing this work, because it was definitely by accident. I was looking for my portfolio of boards in 2016. At the time, I was on two boards and looking for board number three and four, as I had watched my male mentors climb the corporate ladder and get on two, three or four boards and retire out. And, you know, they're making six figures. They've got their stock options. They're set. They're going skiing. They're, you know, traveling with their families. And that was where I was going. At the same time, there was a lot of media coverage about not enough women on boards. It seemed like there was a real kind of rush going on about that. And I myself experienced this at the board table because for 30 years, I was the only woman in the room. And when the question came up, who do you know? I had like three women that I would recommend because women were not my friend in my career. I found that many of them stabbed me in the back, whereas the men were very, very supportive and mentored me and helped me and financed me. I mean, you know, I, I just hung out with the guys. So I basically was like one of the guys. 
So I was in a dilemma because I could not name more women myself to recommend for board. So I started, you know, consciously setting up coffee, lunch, dinner, talk cocktails with women leaders and asking for introduction to women in Denver. I'm in Denver, but I do a lot of work in Canada because I sit on a lot of Canadian boards and in Europe and England, et cetera, et cetera. And I talked to 200 women over 18 months and asked them three questions. Why aren't more women on boards? Why aren't you on a board? And tell me about your background. And over that time frame and meeting all these women is where I, re I learned that there actually were a lot of what I thought were qualified women, very experienced women that I thought could get on boards and that there were gaps of what they didn't know of how to get on a board, what it's like in the boardroom, or even that they could get paid to do board work. And so then my next mission was, well, I'm gonna go find a program for them. So I volunteered for you know the Women's Chamber Mentor Program, and I started looking online. I found the Harvard program, I found Kellogg. But to get into those, you had to be the CEO of a big company. And for a woman, that left 99% of us out. And the mentor program I signed up for they assigned me one woman for 12 months with no structure, like no plan, no checklist. And I thought to myself, if we do it this way, we're never going to get there. This is not OK. And one of my male peers at the time said to me, Michelle, why don't you do something about this? Because you light up when you talk about these women. And that was kind of the seed that was planted. Because remember, I was on my path, my own path to semi-retire and just sit on boards and work part-time. So making the decision to start a new venture and build a program, because I don't do anything halfway, I do it one and a half, um, was a big commitment. But I woke up in the middle of the night and I, the question was, hey, if I design this, what does it look like? And I stayed up all night, filled out a legal pad, and I basically wrote my business plan. And I launched. and. Um, that was the middle of 2017. I ran my pilot. And in 2018, I was in full-blown teaching in Canada and the United States um, four times a year in person. And, you know, with the commitment to train a thousand women, I set a pretty big goal for myself. And I, I'm not very patient. I want to get this done as quickly as possible. So um, that's why I filmed my class in uh, 2022. And now we have this online course that's offered. So that gives you a little idea of how this all came to be. And so fast forward to where we are today, I've now trained um, 20 cohorts, um, 179 women in nine countries. We filled 106 corporate boards so far, everything from small startup to Fortune 500. I'm industry agnostic. Um, and eight women have become CEOs. Uh, which I count too, because that's also a big decision-making position. And eight new companies have been formed by women who went through my course. So it can be very transformational for some people in different ways that I didn't expect. Uh, but we now have this amazing community of ACE certified graduates um, who I champion every day of my work life and my breathing life because um, my goal and my job is to encourage and help them as much as I can to get on boards and to stay on boards and to do the best they can when they get there. So what I'd like to do now is share a little presentation with you with some statistics about where we are now and what women like to know about getting on boards. So let me get my view here, full screen mode, here we go. All right, can everybody see my screen? Got it, Heather? Yes, I can see it. Thank you very much, Michelle. Okay, great. All right. So how do we get to the top? Well, we're, we get there in different ways. Some of you are corporate people. I'm an entrepreneur. So, um, you know, we all have a different uh, pathway, if you will, to getting to the top. But there's a Harvard study that was done a while ago, and many of you probably heard about this, where when a man and a woman have equal background of about 60% of what they need, and are offered a promotion or 
um, let's say a board seat, the man is more likely to raise his hand and say, pick me, I'll give it a go. And the woman is more likely not to raise her hand. And I think that's because in her mind, she's thinking, wait a second, I only have 60%, I need to get to 100. So I really need another degree, or I need, um, you know, uh, a more experience or fill in the blank. She may also have those sayings in her head that are going around like, well, I don't know if I'm good enough. I don't know if I'm worthy, right? So we, it, it can be any of those, but we are preventing our own selves from getting in the game by not raising our hand. So I like to tell that anecdote to mixed groups. And the first couple that I told that to, I turned to the man and I said, what's your number? And he said, 10%. And I was like, 10%? He said, yeah, I just raise my hand and then I go figure it out. And in subsequent groups, the, the numbers for men, um, their answers are typically when I ask them between 25 and um, 60%. No one's ever said I have to have 100%. But let's take it out of the gender thing and go back to our 10% guy. 10% is pretty low. Um, he's pretty, you know, he's pretty out there with that. But he also said, I go figure it out. I'm pretty sure every one of you as successful women have had something in your life that you wanted to attain a degree, a job, um, a certain kind of certification, or uh, maybe <clears throat> it's a relationship. And you didn't know what it was going to be like, but you figured it out, right? So we all have the skills to figure it out. So what I want you to do is let's just think about this as a shift in mindset, which is not about gender. And that mindset is when that question is asked, you raise your hand and you say, yes, pick me. And even though you're scared on the inside, don't listen to that voice. Keep your hand up because you can figure it out. So it's, it's just that simple. Um, the other thing is we have to be prepared. I've seen this um, women getting on board since 2016 really change a lot over the last years that I've been doing this. Few hundred women interested back then. Now there are thousands. It's very competitive and there are a limited number of seats. So the more you are, are prepared, the better off you are going to be. And so I really believe in that because you can blow it by going out, you know, and saying, I want to get on a board, but not being completely ready and having your, you know, your tools in the toolkit, like your resume and your you know, LinkedIn and all that stuff fixed up in order to make you show up as the best candidate. Um, you may know Frank Justra. He's one of my best friends and a mentor to me. And one of the things he always said to me was do something that scares you. And so this might be scary when you get to it. So, but it's okay. You want to push through again, using the mindset, Hey, I can figure this out. And our mentors can make all the difference. And for me, you know, like with Frank and another, I don't know how many men and people that helped me. Well, I do it's 50 last time I counted. Okay. So what we need to know about women in the boardroom, this is one of my favorite photographs. This is from 1975. This is Catherine Graham in the boardroom of the Associated Press. So if you've seen the movie, The Post or haven't, it's a great movie with Meryl Streep. It's the story of how she got into the boardroom. Um, unfortunately, we still have a very high percentage of boards that are all white male and do not have any women. So there's still a lot of need and opportunity um, out there. So let's look at where we stand. So in 2022, this is a little dated, but I'm sure it's still very close to where we are. We were about 20% all over the world of women on boards. So keep in mind, these are only the reporting boards. Um, when we look at North America, in the Fortune 500 in the US, we are the highest we've ever been, 33%, which is actually very amazing. And I believe that there's only one board on the Fortune 500 that only has one woman on their board. The rest of them all have multiple women on their boards. So they're making great strides and they're leading the way, but it's a few hundred companies. And when we look at Canada, Canada's a little bit behind. They We were neck and neck for a while, but I think Canada's a little bit behind uh, the U.S. as far as women on boards. So on um, the big boards, I'm talking about the top 100. And minority women really picked up a lot after George Floyd. Mm -hmm. And we saw a lot of demand for minority women to um, apply for board seats. So 
uh, there was a, a big increase, 18 to 20 percent of uh, minorities, men and women who were um, uh, added and appointed to boards in 2021. The number has dropped a little bit um, recently because I think, you know, a lot of those groups that wanted to have minorities are there. I don't see specific um, requests in board searches anymore that will say we want a black woman, but I can tell you for about two to three years, it was like that, very specific. Um, so everybody's included now. I think that we've crossed a, a line of, you know, what your background is, is not as important as your skills and experience and what you bring to the table. So I think we've, we've crossed over that and it's a fair, fair field for more women overall. Okay, so let's look at the rest of the market. So in the in the Russell 3000, so keep in mind, we just talked about the top 100, top 500 companies, so a few hundred, but now we've got thousands that still don't have um, more than 20% women on their boards. And in the United States, California passed legislation in 2019 that was a requirement for companies to appoint women to their boards which said you must have three women on your board by the end of 2022. So 20, you know, so that happened 21, 20, 20, 21, 22, all that the, the companies, the 96% of them were in compliance and it was also litigated. There was a lawsuit against this legislation from day one. And at the end of 22, they won the case. So it was actually put down in the state, which is very unfortunate because there were other states that were looking to take that on and make that a, um, you know, a requirement for their companies. And I don't believe we'll see more because that, of that lawsuit, unfortunately, but it did work in California because it took three years to get the lawsuit through. So the majority of all those companies had three women on their boards. So that, that bumped our numbers quite a bit. In 2020, the NASDAQ asked the Securities and Exchange Commission here if we could have every NASDAQ company have a requirement of one woman and one minority or woman on their boards. And the SEC came back and said, we took it under consideration and what we're going we're gonna to say is the requirement is they have to report whether they have a woman and um, a minority or another woman on their board but it's not going to be a requirement that they have to have them. So in Canada, you have a similar law in place, a regulation in place, which is um, uh, comply or uh, explain. And that is done by the Toronto Stock Exchange. And I know the OSC in Ontario have those hand in hand. So it helps, but it really doesn't make them do it, unfortunately. And, and so what happens is, they, they put in a standard paragraph in all their filings when they're public. And it says, you know, we looked, we couldn't find a qualified woman or minority. And so we're not going to do it. So what what's going to be the biggest push and help for us is through external ISS and um, investor groups that say, wait a second, if you don't have women on your boards, we're not going to play with you. So Goldman Sachs came out and said, if you want to go public um, and you want us to be your banker, we will be your banker if you have a diverse board. If you don't, we will not be your banker. So those kinds of external pressures will continue to help get more women into the boardroom. So this is a some numbers from Director Moves Research, which is one of the um, places that I subscribe to. It's really reasonable. Um, I recommend you check it out. You can get a 30 day free trial on this and they post twice a week, all of the positions in C-suite and boards and movement in the United States of every company that has a market cap of 150 million or more. They also track gender and they started in 2018. So I just like to look at this and go, wow, look at all the women that got on boards from 18 all the way through 22 and then in 23, we saw this huge drop off where it there just weren't that many boards that at all, right? 
So I, um, it's an anomaly. I don't know why we didn't have as many board placements in 23 as we did in the previous years. Um, I'm looking at the numbers right now. We're, um, you know, and I'm hoping that we're going to see those numbers pick up again. This is a perfect time to me for looking for boards um, between now and June, because a lot of the companies go through their annual general meetings and they need to get, you know, if they need to do interviews, if they're going to have new board members, they need to get that all in place between now and, you know, the next couple months. So it's they, if they're looking, they're on a rush. Um, compensation. So in the U.S., um, this is a report that came out in the fall of last year from Grant Thornton. And basically what it says is the average for a Russell 2000 company uh, compensation for a director is about $200,000. And this is a combination of your cash and um, equity package on an annual basis. So not too shabby, right? Um, I think that's something that we all, we all sign up for that, right? Um, but we still need more women on boards. And I have a lot of reasons why I want to see more women on boards. It isn't just about the numbers it's really that I think women deserve to be on boards. And as I met those 200 women and more women since then, I've probably talked to thousands of women now, just so many who I think could bring value to tables and really make differences. So I still am very committed to helping to get as many women on boards as possible. I can get on my three or four boards. I'm not going to move the needle. If I can help hundreds of women and train a thousand women to get on boards. Now we're talking, you know, like that's what's going to make the difference. So that's why I made the decision to open up my, um, you know, secret sauce, if you will, that culture in the boardroom that uh, that I have uh, experienced and share it with as many women as I possibly can. So let's just take a quick peek at the CEO role. So in the CEO role in the biggest companies, the percentage in the states is at 10%, and it, it kind of goes like 10, 9, 10, 11, 10, 9. It's a tough position. It's a big job, and it's where women uh, and men make the biggest decisions, and that's why I follow it. If your name is John or Michael or David, you have a better chance of being a CEO of a major company than if you're a woman. So we have a lot of work to do in that realm as well. Um, but it's not like being a director, right? It's not a part-time job. It's got a lot more to it. So I can also see the other side of the coin where women go, well, I'm not sure I want to take that big of a, you know, leap, but it can be a very lucrative and um, great stepping stone for your career. So I do agree with Ruth Bader Ginsburg in that you know, we do we do deserve and we belong to be in the places where the biggest decisions are being made. And I also, because I'm a nerd in business, I believe that the most important room in the in the world basically is the business. Uh, and business is the boardroom. And this is where the power and the money are. And the men are in the majority right now making the decisions. You and I are living in a world that those big decisions are being made by men primarily. And I have a really good life. I'm not saying that they do a bad job at all. I just would love to see what it's going to be like with women at the table helping to make those decisions where we complement each other and we bring those different characteristics. You know, women are really, really good at um, <clears throat> planning and organizing, seeing the bigger picture taking into consideration a lot of things that men might not be covering at that top level. They leave it to management. And then when management brings it up, um, you know, like it might be a mental health program, they go, nope, don't have it in the budget. Bam, not doing it. You know, so I think there's so many things that we can talk about at the table and help um, to change that and to make our world better uh, for everybody. So here's what women need to know. The practical side is the board governance, the financial acumen. What are your risks and liabilities? What about gender dynamics in the boardroom and how do you get on a board? The secret stuff is understanding the patriarchal model and the culture in the boardroom because 
that's not something you can YouTube or Google. It's a very secret sanctum, okay? Inner sanctum. Um, your board competence, you might have some that you're not aware of, or you may need some, right? So you've got to understand that. And the executive vernacular, which is my term for how we communicate with each other at that very top level in the C-suite and the boardroom. And then how to brag about yourself. This is something that can be very hard for women who are really successful. And that might be you. Um, people ask me a lot of these questions. So I made a couple slides to try and cover a few of them. Um, you don't have to be the CEO of a company. You don't have to have you know, a CFO, CFA, CPA, financial background in order to get on a board. Um, in fact, the boards are looking for financial people usually about 25% of the time. So there are many other skills that they're looking for. Um, younger people are getting on boards. It used to be they wouldn't really look at anyone over 50 or under 50, but because of technology like you know AI, cybersecurity, blockchain, all these kinds of things, um, younger people are getting on the board because our average board member is a 63-year-old white male. And that means we have a lot of men who are in their 70s and 80s and even 90s. And their technology experience is very limited. And so sometimes it's important to have a tech person who's on the board. And then the compensation median is around 300,000 for the Fortune 500. It's actually about three and a quarter now on an annual basis. <clears throat> so what we do at ACE to help women get on boards, I have um, two major offerings. One is the live class, which I call it that. I teach live um, three times a year and I do part of it um, virtually. And then uh, the second part is it live in Denver. But this one is uh, where we have the board certification. We facilitate your board brand. We teach executive board pre presence um, by doing a board meeting. So we have board role play. Um, and then also I talk about the confidence and competency, which is important for women to have in getting on boards and then being successful once you get in the room. And then we also provide a plan for you, an action plan. So when you leave the course, you've got that in hand and it's up to you then to, you know, execute on it. You go into our profile catalog, so we promote you and also give you introductions to the board opportunities. If you participate in our online board certification, I filmed that over three days with a classroom of women, and it's 22 modules, and you get group coaching with me, and you also get your certification. Um, so that also includes, uh, you know, I mean, that, that, that provides you with basically the same kind of content as you get in the live class. Um, but the biggest difference is, you know, kind of the after you graduate support is not included in the online uh, course. And then I mentioned our results to you earlier, and now it's time for Q&A. Okay, it's not like any of our, our uh, participants here are shy, so I am sure there's lots of questions, so please just, uh, you know, feel free to just kind of shout out. I just also wanted to mention that I am um, taking the, I am taking the, um, the online certification as well, so um, because I, I believe that it's something that we, we need to investigate and, and I am, I'm very happy to say that uh, the results that we've heard from other folks that have been very, very good. So again, this is just another opportunity for some board education. So questions for Michelle, please. Um, so I guess a, a question for Michelle, but also for Heather, because I know Heather, you're involved, I believe with the ICD program as well. Um, so, you know, if, if someone was going to decide to take uh, board governance, board readiness program, how would this program compare to the ICD program? Boy, you just teed that right up. <laughs> so um, there are a number of differences. So I know ICD has been in place for a very long time. 
And um, I have not taken it myself. So I don't know content wise, but I can tell you from people that I've talked to and what I do know about it. It's a program that is much longer. I think it's about a year. My program is done in less than eight weeks. Um, they train men and women. And my understanding is they do mostly case studies. I don't think they cover gender dynamics at all. Um, the other thing in our course, because I only train women. So I bring into this, you know, we have a very private um, conversation about the differences. And, and it's important for us to understand how we behave in the boardroom. And even when we're in our executive roles with a gentleman, I actually have a male CEO who let me film him in his presentation and talking to us about gender dynamics and giving his insights of how we can be more successful. So for example, it's important where you sit in the room. It's important who you're, who you're um, talking to. It's important, you know, uh, if you go, it, it, it's, there's so many nuances about this that we are unaware of unless someone teaches us that. And so John Kelly is the gentleman who does that for us. And it's a fantastic, add-on. Um, the other thing is our program is cheaper. You know, it's not as expensive as ICD. And um, we also promote you. If you take the live class, um, we promote you in the aftermarket. So we feature a profile of every one of our graduates. We, you know, feature announcements on everyone that gets on boards. And you also are invited to private events that are for our graduates. For the online course, you still get your certification and all the tools you need to go out and get yourself on a board. And I do group coaching, so you get an opportunity to interact with me, for instance, on your board resume, because that's a really big deal to me. Like, I think when you nail your board resume and you go through and really do the hard work on it, you're going to be able to talk about yourself a lot easier. You're going to be able to represent yourself. Now, one more thing. When I decided to put this program together, I wanted to figure out how do I help women with that gap? Remember I talked about the gap in the beginning and that 10% at the very top of what I call, you know, executive competence and competency. So my program covers all that practical stuff I mentioned. And then I built about 20 exercises into the course and they're specifically designed to help you discover your own confidence at that top 10%. And I'm telling you, you are competent and confident about what you know. And this little piece on the top, the icing on the top that I teach you is the thing that gets you there. And it can really be helpful because it's really this mixture of like, I'm opening up my 63 year old white brain because I feel like that's who I am on the inside being trained by men for 30 years. And I share everything. So there's not a secret. You get to know kind of what they're thinking, how they're doing it, and how to communicate with them on a peer-to-peer -peer basis because we unconsciously represent ourselves in a different enough way a lot of times that we're not even considered. So I want to eliminate as many barriers to entry as possible. So I know I get, you guys all got this um, exercise that I shared with um, you in, because Katarina mailed it to you, the value proposition questionnaire. So this is one of the one of the exercises that we do in class. And it's just a tool to like a checklist, like what have you done? What haven't you done? And I you know, want to make sure that you look at this and go, wait a second. Cumulatively, I have accomplished a lot of things. And there are probably a number of things on this list that you can add into your resume that count as far as your board um, qualifications but you didn't know it until you looked at an actual checklist of what a value, what are value propositions for you? Does that answer your question? Okay. Yeah, so also you. relative to your, um, your question regarding ICD. Yes, I have taken my ICD and I thought it was an amazing program. Certainly um, very, a lot of Canadian content. Um, I, I'm not sure how much you get into kind of some of the, the more regulatory, um, you know, differences, Michelle, I'm sure you don't, but I'm sure you don't focus on that either, uh, nor does, and ICD does, of course, touch on it. Um, but I found uh, ICD very, very helpful. 
but not everyone has that ability to take, you know, three, five day, you know, I, I guess, what is it? Five, three day weekends. I can't remember. It was way more than that. <laughs> it was a while ago since I did it. Um, and I just think people need options, you know, options for getting whatever works, whatever works for you uh, in your particular situation. And certainly Michelle's uh, course comes highly recommended and gives you the certification to show that you have the governance background as well as you know all the other aspects that are required as a as a board member. Um, I see Jen just had to sign off now, but I was going to ask her the same question. But and there is a little bit more content right now actually on ICD about the gender diversity question um, because I think you know it's something that when you are a fellow board member, you also have to bring into the into the boardroom um, to make sure that that diversification is happening. So certainly that is also being discussed at ICD, but I'm sure, Michelle, you take it to a to a whole new level. So I did do. that yeah. did that answer your question, Wilma? I just wanted to make sure that we did the comparison. ICD is also fantastic. I'm not yeah. I'm not saying that um, it's just a this is a different a different tool, you know, probably it's very, very similar tools, but you do it in your own time online, which to me is a real benefit. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. there's like a 300 page workbook that goes along with this. And I work with securities attorneys as well as U.S. securities. So the actual video, when you get to the legal um, module, it is a Canadian attorney. Natasha Kiernan mm -hmm. is one of our graduates who does the presentation. The rules are very similar. It's not my job as a director to know the rules and regs. It's my job to keep myself legal. Um, and I, you know, I've always deferred to the le to the legal counsel when I have a question or to the auditors. So you're going to see some information in the workbook where we do have a presentation by um, a Canadian uh, securities attorney and also a package that it has uh, the information from the U.S. standpoint. So um, they're very complicated in some ways, but you know, also you have to remember there's a layer of the regulators. And you, in Canada, you have regulators in every one of your provinces, whereas in the US, we only have a national, we have the SEC. But when it, you're on a public company board, the company will defer to the most stringent. They're gonna meet the, they're going to meet the requirements in every one of those jurisdictions. So they may have three or four legal counsels because they've got to make sure that they're checking every one of those boxes as they go along. But they, you know, um, they've got it figured out. It's just that you're not required to know all of that yourself to the nth degree. You just need to know how to how to maneuver through that. Thank you. I, I appreciate the response. And unfortunately, I, I need to go. Um, in terms of credibility, so are boards looking to see if you've had board governance training? Um, does it matter so much what the designation is or if you have a designation? I'm curious about that. And that was part of the heart of my question about ICD versus this program. Yeah. So certification is becoming more and more popular. And I can tell you that my own candidates, I have a number of them who were selected because they did have a certification and the other candidates did not. So it's up to the companies and our designation has been rec has been recognized by companies for sure, all the way, you know, like in um, um, the US and in Canada. And I have a woman in my group who, a graduate who is on a board in France and in France, it's required to have a certification. And mm. she provided them with our information. The regulators reviewed it and said, yep, that's exactly what you need. You're done. So um, yeah, so it works. And again, I want to eliminate as many barriers to entry for women as possible. We had the very first cert certification in the entire U.S., if you can believe that, in 2018. So I was on the bandwagon before anybody was like thinking this might be a big deal. But um, I, want to, I want to make sure you have as many benefits as you can, because as I mentioned, it's very competitive out there. So you've got to really have your act together and if you have the certification, it's just one more thing, but it's not a requirement. Thank you. Uh, somebody, Jackie. Might I um, oh, ask Sean. a question? Oh, yes. sorry. Go ahead, Sean, and then I'll do Jackie's. 
Um, yeah, I guess I was just wondering, I really appreciated your comment, Michelle, about um, um, employee engagement and, and that a lot of men aren't thinking of some of the, um, I'll call it the softer skills, skill sets that um, yeah. people in different, different functional areas bring. And I, through a lot of the conversations I've had, definitely, I've been told, well, you know, if you're coming from a softer skills skill set, um, that's really not what the boards are looking for. They're looking for finance, they're looking for lawyers, they're looking for engineers, and they're not looking for, and uh, uh, as somebody with an MBA, but focused on HR communications. That's that's been my skill set, and my experience has been that people aren't kind of interested in that skill set. Right. Um, <laughs> I would say that it is harder. At the same time, companies are um, you know you never know. Like there are individuals. Ninety percent of you are going to get on boards with people who already know you who worked with you, who went to school with you, they like you, they know you're really good at what you do kind of thing. And 10% of you get on boards because of recruiters or board searches. So your low hanging fruit are really the people who know you. So if you're really good at what you do, you're going to get picked and they want you for more reasons than just, you know, kind of that skill set. It's really about they trust you. They have a relationship with you. So there can be reasons why you get on boards that are not related to that, because I have lots of women in my courses who are CMOs, CHROs, um, you know, management. I train women from their 30s to their 70s, and I've had women get on boards from their 30s to their 70s. OK, and, um, you know, it's really depends on you individually. And are is it the right time, right day and you run into the right company that needs your kind of experience to bring to the table. And we know that they need this, but they may not be at the point where they're ready or willing to do it. Um, so how do we package you in a way and all your background so that you tick off a lot of boxes? So a lot of women that I work with that are in people, you know, kind of uh, culture, you know, I look at that and I go, well, we've got this term called ESG. Do you fit under that? What kinds of background goes under that? Because a lot of boards are looking for people that have ESG. So you might be able to get yourself branded in that way. That's going to make you a lot more um, palatable to board searches. And, um, you know, and as you said, it, what I say is like one woman in the boardroom, your first, you know, your first thing you can say, hey, can I look at comp? Are we paying our women the same as we are our men and our minorities? Are we titling them the same if they have the same job description? If not, why not? We can change pay equity like in a, you know, in a decade instead of in 50 years, which is what the, the trajectory is. I mean, it's ridiculous. So there, you know, there are so many places where we can make a difference once we get ourselves in there. And that's why it's so important. Like, let's get you packaged. Let's get you ready. Let's get you pushed in there and um, and get you on that board seat. And it might be a private company. If any of you are consultants and you have um, clients that you're working with, companies you really like, you can be one conversation away from getting on a board. And that conversation sounds like this. Hey, I really like you. You really like me. I'd like to bring, you know, more to the table for you. Let's, you know, form, why don't you form a board? Or if they don't have one, or would you consider, you know, putting me on your board? Because I'd like to do more for you in your company. And I've had many of my candidates get on boards that way. So the pri I didn't talk about the stats for private companies, but what I've seen is it's 11% or lower. So we really have a lot of work to do. We have a lot of places to go, and we just need to get on the horse and get going. Um. Okay, I'm going to go to Jackie. Are you here still, Jackie? Okay, so the level of finance background to be successful in the course, I have a so I have selected a book, an accounting book, which is a basic book that I give to everybody. The challenge was, oh my gosh, I'm going to have women who don't have any finance and women that are CPAs. How am I going to do this? But I have a book that I use to teach my financial accounting that works for everybody. And what I want you to learn is the how to read financial statements. That's what we teach you. That's what you need to know. So you will be very comfortable 
in doing that. Well, I can't say very comfortable because some people just are not numbers people, but you're going to know more than you did going in. Um, and you'll have a tool that you can refer to in getting yourself into that side of things. Um, Levon, do you have a question? Cause you're unmuted. I'm just guessing. Well, I, I had a few and some of them have come up in the chat and, oh. you know, just, um, you, a couple comments you made. One is, so I think your course is fantastic. Here's a bit of the, the dilemma. If, especially with Canadian companies and recruiters, it seems like everyone focuses on, do you have your ICD? So, you know, we pay the money, we invest, we get this certification, but is it recognized in Canada? Yours like, or mine? Yours. Okay. Oh yeah, because I have a lot of um, candidates who are Canadian, on Canadian boards, absolutely. I I, I would say um, probably a third of the women that are I've trained or that are certified are Canadian women. Okay, that that's helpful. Yes. And just a comment for the group on the ICD designation. This is very interesting, a chicken and egg scenario. I applied, it was pre-COVID, um, to for the course, and the feedback I got was they they actually rejected my application, wouldn't take my money because they said you will probably get more out of the course if you have some board experience. Because I think of all these case studies they do, but then you go and apply for boards and boards are like, but you don't have a designation. Anyways, it just left me a bit uh, perplexed at the time. Yeah, I've heard that. And I, and so again, that's another barrier to entry as far as I'm concerned. And that's why I, I, I realized that, wait a second, we are missing this piece of education as women overall. Like I would love to see this go into a place where I have, I have access to speak to young girls about this and younger women who are just starting their careers because this kind of mentorship has not ever been talked about for women. So that big chunk that you've missed, you're 30 years behind, 20 years behind, 10 years behind, and guys have it that's just built into their whole system. The teams, the, you know, the locker room, the golf course, this, the, you know, all the good old boy stuff, all of that is built into their whole culture and it's not, you know, broken out and talked about and all that kind of stuff. So this is something I think that we can really do a lot to help each other in order to understand this and to be a part of it if we choose to, not everybody chooses to. Right. Yeah. No, that, you know what, that's helpful. And I think your course sounds great. And I'm very thankful that there are women out there, you know, those who choose to support each other, because like you, I, I've experienced those who want to stab you in the back too. <laughs> so thank you for being a supporter of other females. Absolutely. You know, I had to do my own personal, um, you know, transformation to get there, right? Because I was like, Ooh, how am I going to teach women? I've, I never even belonged to a woman's group, you know? Um, and what it came down to is I really had to, I, I did a lot of soul searching and a lot of internal work in order to do this work myself. And my commitment is that I stand in front of the room and I'm completely open, vulnerable and um, accessible to every woman that I work with. And um, that's the only way that I can approach this and really make it work. Excellent. OK, I think uh, I'll, that's enough air time for me. I'll go back on mute. OK, that's fine. Thank you. Um, I also encourage, you know, as an affiliate partner, I'll just share with you, I have other affiliate partnerships with other women's groups, and it really works well if you decide to do the class, to take it together. We have this um, discount is good through the end of March. And the reason it works to do it together in your um, organization is you can form your own accountability groups and meet with each other like on a weekly basis and check in. How you doing? What module are you on? I have 22 modules in the in the course. So you go through 22 modules and then you get your um, certification link and you take your test. Your test, you have 60 days to take it. It's 70 questions. It's a two hour test. Uh, you have, um, I think you have two hours to take it. Um, and you can take it up to two times. And um, yeah, and it's open book. So you already have the workbook. I tell you in the course what's going to be on the test. I'm like, keep, you know, this is important board governance, keep it on your mind. You got to remember this. Um, so you kind of know where you're going with it. 
And then once you're done, you can add it to your LinkedIn. We actually have a badge that you can go in and look up Corporate Directors International and it'll pop up. You put it in there, put your, the, you know, the month and year that you passed, and then it's on your LinkedIn. Ready for you to use. But that's what I would encourage you to do. I think our discount goes for $1,000 off the um, online course through the end of March. And I have, I will have a fall class that I'm teaching live. If anybody's interested in that, you can email me directly and I will give you a $2,000 discount off of my live class. And I only take up to 12 people. So if that's of interest to you, let me know right away because um, you will want to get your spot reserved as soon as possible. Quick okay. Question, Michelle, yeah. to that uh, live class. So that would be live online class. So it's two parts. Part one is four days online virtually. So it's a Wednesday through a Saturday. Mm -hmm. And it's all day, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, half day, Saturday. And it's Denver time, like eight to five kind of thing. And then there's five to six weeks where I call it home study, but you practice what I teach you. And then we meet in person for one day in Denver at the end of that. Um, and there's a specific date. So that's part two. We do more training. I bring in, bring in the securities attorneys and the accountants to talk to you guys. And then you graduate, have a little party. We invite some of the other ACE grads to share with you. And then you get your link to take your certification and you're part of the alumna. So then you're in, you know, and I don't let any of my ladies go after they go through my live class. So <laughs> warning, I'm warning you. <laughs> You'll be stuck with me. Could you please comment on the cost difference between the live class and the virtual class? Um, Kim was yeah. having the one thing that I wanted to mention. So uh, we are going to be offering the discount for ready 2024. It will be available until end of March. And the cost is with the discount applied is about 5,000 US dollars, uh, which converts to Canadian dollars <clears throat> about $6,770. Yes. And I have two ways you can pay online. You can pay the whole thing at once or five payments. So I have a payment plan if you want to do it that way. The live class is regular price, um, 11995 So it's twelve grand. So I give you $2,000 off of the regular price if you decide you want to do that one. Same deal. You can pay all at once or I will uh, or I have a five uh, payment plan. Michelle, it's um, Linda. I, I should have asked Heather while she was here, but I'll ask you. I am a sitting board member on both a private and a public board. Yes. Um, what's the incremental value to someone who is an experienced board member in your class? So, you know, that's a really good question. And I have had women come through my class who are ICD certified. They're on boards. And I'm like, what are you doing in my class? And they're like, I think you can help me be a better director because of the gender diversity that you're the gender dynamics you teach. And also I want to get on a bigger board and I think I can um, learn something on how to do that. And so it depends on you as an individual um, as far as that goes. But if you're already on boards and certification is not required, let me give you a little hint. I am going to be offering um, a way for sitting board members just to take the certification and not have to go through the class. So I'm hoping to launch that in the next quarter. Um, so if that's something you're interested in, um, it should be coming then. Is that something I could just send you an email and you can keep me posted on then, please? Is that possible? It is. I think we're just launching the website so um, we can get you on the wait list. But yeah, just send me an email and I'll, um, I'll put you on the wait list for that. Just a quick question. Sorry, I, I came in a little bit late because I was stuck in traffic and then my computer decided to update. Um, but um, I'm looking forward to the recording so I can watch those 15 minutes uh, that I missed. But um, I had a question. I sit on, well, two not-for-profit boards. I've been on like the condo board, which is the worst kind of <laughs> thankless job that you can do like in terms of boards, but I learned a lot. Um, and um, I'm on, I sit on a board of a not-for-profit. I'm currently vice chair for um, this not-for-profit here in Calgary. Now, I'm wondering, uh, would that qualify me to challenge a certain exam or or not? No, uh, when I do my, when we offer ours, you'll have to be sitting board for at least a year on a public or private corporate board. Okay, yeah. Yeah. So, 
not-for-profits do not count. No, uh -uh. it's totally different. And I actually uh -huh. discourage my women from getting on nonprofit boards. It takes your time, money, and energy, and they never tell men to get on a corporate on, on a nonprofit board first. So um, you can spend that time doing this course, another course. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's so many other things you can do to try and get yourself on a paid board. And I want you in the boardroom where these decisions are being made. You're going to make so much more. Um, you know what men do? They write the check. So what do we do when we're in a nonprofit? We go, man, we need a sponsor. Let's go to this big company. So you go to the corporation and you say, here's my sponsor packets. They're like happy to write you a check for 20 grand because it's, they don't have to sit on the board and do the work. They're like, here's the check. Boom. And the guy's off and his career is, is sailing up mm -hmm. because he's investing in himself, not in that. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. Just my opinion. No, very fair. Absolutely. My opinion. And I've been on nonprofits. I had my own for 15 years, so I know. But um, listen, I think it's time for us to say good night, ladies. Thank you so much. I'm so glad that you could be here. I hope this was helpful. Whether you um, decide to take this on and spend some more time with me in the future or not, I just really appreciate your spending the time and asking the questions and listening to what we have to say. Thank you. Thank this you. This is great, Michelle. Thank, Thank you. you. So I would like to thank you. Well, thank, thank you for the you. informative session and making yourself available to answer all these questions. So this was fantastic. We are going to be sending follow-up emails for people to be able to access the discount and the links where to sign up. Mm -hmm. Thank you Great. so much. You want to stay thank on, you. Katarina, and we'll chat after everybody goes. Bye. Bye. Nice to see everyone. Bye. Bye.